Catherine, you're on mute. Well, that's not good. <laughs> and welcome to everybody and thank you for joining us today. Day two, as Anne mentioned, of our 28th annual symposium. Hopefully next year, uh, our section will be able to get together uh, and perhaps sponsor an event so that we can all celebrate being around each other in person again. Um, before we get started with our presentation, I do want to thank Mechanics Bank for their continued sponsorship of our event. We appreciate it so very much. Today, we have Doug Bonney and Kevin Holt of the Bonney Law Group, who, as you know, are going to speak on uh, uh, tax planning from Prop 13 to Prop 19 and the new constitutional amendment. I know they have a lot of material to go over, so I'm going to get started, have them get started right now. Thank you very much. Doug, Kevin. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, I think we I think we fixed the problem. Okay. Here we go. Um, okay. So, um, like we said, property tax planning from 13 to 19. We're going to talk about how we navigate the new property tax landscape, help our clients achieve uh, property tax savings while helping them also, of course, comply with the vision. So some of the goals of our presentation today, we're going to um, overview the history and dynamics of the California ballot initiative. Um, and it's worth maybe mentioning uh, up front why, why go into detail on, on ballot initiatives? Well, um, if you want to understand Prop 19, you need to understand Prop 13, because we're now in the Prop 13 property tax framework under current law. <clears throat> but to understand Prop 13, you really need to understand uh, the ballot initiative and um, the, the history of that and um, how that created Prop 13, how that continues to create new laws, such as Prop 19, how it could create new laws in the future. Once we do that overview, we'll, we'll talk about um, Prop 13, we'll survey the terrain, and then we will identify specifically the changes caused by Prop 19. Finally, we'll briefly scan the horizon for possible future property tax changes. So what is the ballot initiative process? Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but I wanted to give you uh, a resource to look at if you want more information. Uh, and that is the uh, statewide initiative guide that I've um, referenced here. Um, some of the key points I do want to point out are that to get on the ballot, a ballot initiative needs 8% of the total votes cast for the Office of Governor at the previous gubernatorial election. Um, so that's currently about 1 million signatures. So if you just pass that 8% threshold, you're on the ballot, and then it's, it's a 50% threshold to pass a new law or even to amend the California Constitution. And there's a 180-day period during which the um, campaign uh, for the initiative can obtain the required signatures. And then all of that needs to be completed 131 days before the relevant election. So what makes ballot initiatives so significant in California? Well, it really um, has to do with the California Constitution and how it can be amended. So there are two primary ways to amend the California Constitution. The first, um, that I'll mention here is the ballot initiative. Like I said, you need 8% of the votes cast in the last gubernatorial election, and then you um, need 50% of the vote on the specific amendment once it 
And uh, it's notable that this is one of the lowest thresholds in the U.S. I think approximately five states have lo even lower thresholds, but we're kind of in the, the top ten or bottom ten, however you look at it, in terms of direct, direct democracy. So the other way that a um, constitutional amendment can be made is to the legislature. But to the legislature, you need a two-thirds vote in each house, in each of the assembly and the senate. So as you can see, this creates a fundamental imbalance in the political process. Um, the uh, direct democracy method to the ballot initiative just needs 50% vote after 8% uh, passing the 8% signature threshold, whereas the legislature needs to pass a very high two-thirds supermajority vote in each house, and then it needs to be approved by referendum with the 50% of the vote. So it's much easier for a initiative campaign to pass a constitutional amendment than for the legislature. It is much harder for the legislature to undo a constitutional amendment after an initiative campaign is successful. Now this imbalance was intended by the voters at the time. Very important to understand. So let's talk about the history. Why did California implement ballot initiatives? Um, from the Perry v. Brown case in 2011 from the California Supreme Court, and they explained that in 1911, there was a widely held view among California voters that the legislature had become so dependent on special interests, had become so corrupt essentially, <clears throat> that they were unable and unwilling to take actions in the public interest. Um, so which special interests are we talking about uh, in 1911? Well, that was the, uh, the era of the railroad, and in California in particular, there was a particularly strong monopoly held by Southern Pacific uh, Railroad. And not only did they have a monopoly, but they had so much leverage in the economy that um, essentially they could, they held complete power to determine whether wheat producers and other agri agricultural products went on the national market, or they're therefore able to extract uh, the producer's profits. And uh, not only were they economically uh, significant, but even just for the society at large in California, uh, the growth of the states and the growth of the various um, population centers depended on the railroad. So they really had ultimate leverage over the economy and over the political process because when the voters attempted to vote in representatives to tax and regulate the railroad, the railroad had so, much, so many financial resources, they were able to essentially bribe legislature to give them um, subsidies, benefits, and to get the votes that they needed to keep the system uh, running in their favor. Um, so this political pressure built up over time, the, this frustration among the voters built up, and, and this time period was called the progressive movement. And in the, in the 1910 election, um, Hiram Johnson, a prosecutor from San Francisco who had been involved in anti-corruption cases with the railroad, was elected governor. Um, they had the votes in the legislature, and so they decided to um, constrain the railroad through more democracy. They thought that more democracy would be the solution, and so they created the ballot initiative process. They also passed women's suffrage in California, so this is a very significant historical time period. and. Um, it created that fundamental imbalance in the California Constitution that we that we know. And uh, it's also fun to point out that um, there was a novel by uh, I believe Frank Norris called The Octopus uh, that was released in 1901. That's about the Southern Pacific Railroad monopoly. Um, many newspapers had cartoons uh, depicting the monopoly as an octopus. So uh, that's just an interesting. Note there. I have some, some references to articles for more. So 
here we are 100, 100 years later, more than 100 years later, after the uh, ballot initiative process was created, and um, certainly don't have to deal with the Oxfords anymore. We're not under a railroad monopoly. But um, has the ballot initiative process tamed special interests completely? Uh, one striking example uh, that we've all experienced recently was the Yes on 22 uh, campaign. Uh, now, there, there are certainly, this is certainly a complex issue, and there are merits on both sides of the argument, but I just want to point out that uh, there were plenty of special interests involved in contributing to that campaign. Uber, DoorDash, Lyft, Instacart, all of these app-based uh, delivery and transportation companies uh, thought in their interest to, to pass this law via constitutional amendment. Um, so in total, they received 205 million uh, contributions, the most in California history, down from the various companies. And uh, perhaps more relevant to the property tax um, area is, of course, Prop 19. Uh, the biggest contributors to that initiative campaign was the California Association of Realtors, and the National Association of Realtors. We're around 45 million, so less than the 200 million on Prop 22, but still a significant amount of money. And uh, also on the other side, on the, the no on Prop 19 side, contributions totaled about $50,000 uh, from Howard Jarvis. <clears throat> so, um, I wanted to kind of visualize how this works and how this affects us as a state planner. So you have a ballot initiative, which is the product of many, um, many forces, complex forces. So you have, you have politics. Um, you know, rep, we, need, we need revenue for social spending. Uh, we have a, a climate of political polarization and negative partisanship we read about um, all the time. We have economics. We have a housing crisis in California, rising home values, inequality, um, high cost of living. All of these things play into the political environment um, and in unpredictable ways uh, affects the laws through the ballot initiative process. Of course, you also have special interests. We talked about realtors. Um, there's the initiative industrial complex. There are firms that are specialists in um, collecting signatures. And of course, you have incentives of the voters and homeowners being a significant block of voters who have an understandable incentive to protect their home values and minim minimize their own tax burden. So all this interacts with the limitations of California law and that fundamental imbalance that we talked about, and it creates a picture like this, where you have opening for the forces acting through the ballot initiative process to affect our property tax landscape. So um, just running through some of the historical examples here, I'm not going to go into each one, but just, just wanted to point out that um, Proposition 13, of course, was passed through the ballot initiative process. Um, after that, for the next 20 years or so, you have um, legislatively referred amendments to kind of impact the, uh, the, the effect of the law at the margins, so parent-child exclusion, based your value transfers, and um, again, those are all legislatively referred to. They passed with two-thirds vote in the legislature before the referendum. And then you, more recently, we have more ballot initiatives changing the property tax laws. You had Prop Proposition 5 in 2018, which was defeated, Proposition 15, defeated in 2020, and of course, Proposition 19, which, how do estate planning professionals fit into the picture? Well, um, we don't impact the forces sh that are creating the landscape, um, but after the fact, we are the ones who are navigating this new terrain, and again, helping our clients to um, arrive at their destination of of course, compliance with the law, but also minimizing their property tax. 
Tiberius. Can I interrupt for a second? Kevin, we've had a couple requests um, for uh, a little bit more volume on your end. If you could speak a little louder, that would be great. Thank sure. you. Okay. Thank Good you. information, just need to hear it. Thank you. Of course. So as we go forward, I think that uh, I, I appreciate what uh, uh, Kevin shared in regards to the historical framework, because I have uh, clients that are asking how this all came to be um, uh, whenever we're talking about uh, property taxes and the changes that uh, have occurred uh, back in February of, uh, of this year. And so uh, to understand uh, Proposition 19, it's always uh, helpful to uh, recall and uh, take a historical perspective of Proposition 13, which was enacted in 1978. And it changed our value from a, or it changed the system from a current value uh, system to an acquisition value framework. So that, um, in essence, what happens is that uh, in the past, it would be reassessed every five years uh, at near or current market values. And as the uh, property values continued to increase, it became problematic for many homeowners who were being priced out of their homes. Thus, uh, Proposition 13 was passed uh, overwhelmingly. You can see in, uh, on June 6 of 1978 that almost 65% of those who uh, uh, were in favor of Proposition 13. And so what that did is it rolled back to the uh, real property assessments in 1975 values, limited the property tax rate that the assessors are able to uh, charge at 1%. Uh, now, on many property tax bills, there are other um, additional assessments, but for the property tax rate under California um, uh, law, it's uh, limited to 1% from that standpoint. And then it's increased at 2% per year. That's the maximum amount that they're able to uh, increase it. And uh, my experience, I've never seen it where it uh, has not uh, been at least 2% per year. Uh, but there are situations in the past where um, a homeowner has been able to, uh, or a property owner has been able to um, uh, petition uh, the assessor with a reduced value so that uh, it's actually less than what it had been in previous years. But uh, at this point, I'm not, uh, we don't foresee that uh, happening, so we're looking at a 2% increase every year. Then the only time the property is reassessed, uh, where you read in the paper that uh, a neighbor is paying um, property taxes of maybe 25000 versus a neighbor who's paying 2500 that's because there was a change in ownership or a new construction when that individual was able to um, that, uh, or purchase that property most recently, whereas the person who is perhaps paying $2,500 per year uh, has held on to that home for, uh, for many years. And so when we look at the uh, legal authority in regards to Proposition 13, that's a part of the California Constitution. And then we also have it uh, implemented uh, by the legislature in the Revenue and Taxation Code, the these code sections. And then we receive regulatory guidance from the Board of Equalization. So they issue property tax rules, opinion letters, and letters to assessors. And uh, their website is very robust and very helpful uh, in regards to uh, finding um, uh, rulings and uh, uh, approaches uh, in regards to uh, certain changes in ownership. And in that, we have various definitions where we have the fair market value which is uh, uh, defined here. Is, um, and then we also have in the definitions full cash value. So these are uh, definitions that uh, come up in the uh, actual uh, provisions that we're going to be talking about. So what is full cash value? That is fair market value, whereas before, when we were talking about um, fair market value, uh, that actually uh, comes out to be the assessed value. And they, they use fair market value because that's what it was at the date of uh, assessment, when, it was, uh, when there was a change in ownership or something of that sort. And so that's something that uh, sometimes is confusing when you think of fair market value, you think of today's current value. That's not the case whereas the full cash value is actually in the uh, property taxes 
scenario, the, uh, the fair market value. That fair market value uh, for the full cash value is, uh, I'm sorry, uh, let, me, let me back up, is actually what it is uh, for the base year. And so that's, that's what it is. I, I misspoke in regards to that. So the base year value is that fair market value as of 1975, uh, the lien date or the date of purchase or a change in ownership. That's when those uh, base year values can substantially increase. So uh, when we look at the taxable value, look at the lesser of the uh, base year value and the inflation factor or the full cash value, which is fair market value. And that's where the decline in value would allow you to uh, be less than value. And then with the, uh, uh, the factor base year value, in a base year, um, it is uh, actually the taxable value uh, that is transferred. And so that is something that is going to be uh, discussed when we talk about uh, uh, the base year value that is transferred under um, parent-child exclusions, as well as in base year uh, value transfers. Uh, typically, the lien date is January 1 of the preceding year. And the fiscal year for uh, property taxes begins July 1st and ends on June 30th. So now we go into uh, some of the uh, legislative enactments, uh, uh, Revenue Taxation Code Section 6, where it defines a change in ownership. And it's a three-pronged test in which there must be a transfer of a present interest, and uh, which includes the beneficial use thereof. The value has to be sub, uh, substantially equal to the value of a fee interest. So that's been uh, a, a question of dispute in, uh, in various cases in regards to uh, whether a present interest has been transferred. And the dispute arose around whether you're looking at um, uh, the transferor or the transferee in regards to this change in ownership. And, uh, Many, uh, in certain cases, they were looking at, well, what did the transferee or transferees receive? Was it equivalent to a fee? And you can have life estates, a term of years, remainder interest, and things of that sort. And sometimes uh, the, uh, it would be ruled that there wasn't a change in ownership. Then in 2010, in the Steinhardt case, this is a Supreme Court case, California Supreme Court case, said uh, essentially it stands for the uh, proposition that you're looking at uh, the value uh, or the interest that was transferred by the transferor. So if they do not retain uh, uh, an interest in that, uh, there are certain interests that they can retain. But if, for example, they retained a life estate, uh, in many cases that would not be uh, deemed ownership. And so my Revenue Taxation Code 60 is kind of the catch-all if it's not a, a particular defined. Section 61 uh, deals with examples of uh, specific uh, uh, interests. And so, for example, if there's a leasehold interest of 35 or more years on a property, that would be deemed the interest that is held by that, uh, that tenant. So, and typically that not only includes the initial term of the lease, but also uh, the ability of the tenant to uh, uh, initiate uh, extensions to that uh, to that lease. Uh, remainder interest, it talks about that. Interest in real property that vests uh, when a revocable trust becomes irrevocable. These are all in Section 61. Now, in Revenue and Taxation Code Section 62, uh, we talk about um, exclusions from a change in ownership. So under 60 and 61, uh, those define changes in ownership, and Section 62 uh, says, uh, notwithstanding 60 and 61, we do have certain exclusions from a change in ownership. So many have uh, been involved with this before. Uh, there's the uh, exclusion for proportional interest transfers. So if, um, if uh, two individuals as uh, co-tenants own a piece of property, let's say 50% each, and they transfer that into, uh, let's say, a, a partnership. As long as they own 
in uh, each in the partnership so that their proportional interests are not different but are the same going in as co-tenants and then becoming uh, partners, uh, then there is no change in the method. Uh, and it's just a change in the method of holding title. Uh, there's no reassessment. So um, that's, that's one that uh, many times is used when, uh, from an estate planning perspective, uh, we're looking at maybe making gifts of real property. And instead of uh, gifting tendency and common interest to, uh, to children, uh, it's put into an entity, and uh, those entity interests are answered. Section 62.3 is another exclusion, and uh, there are details to that, but essentially co-tenants, upon the death of a co-tenant, if you meet certain uh, requirements, it's not a change in ownership at that time. Section 63 deals with uh, the marital exclusion for interspousal transfers. That's another exclusion available. And then we come to section 63.1. And this is kind of where uh, we have uh, this change in the Proposition 19 that we're going to uh, discuss in more detail. But in this change of ownership, um, it does not include specific transfers between parents and children. Now, it's important to uh, still keep in mind section 63.1. It hasn't been repealed. It's just no longer effective as of uh, uh, certain dates in February. However, uh, if you're dealing with a client and perhaps you have a, um, a trust administration that comes into your office, that uh, decedent uh, died prior to February 16 of 2021, then that uh, is deemed a transfer at the date of death. So you would still be under the 63.1 rules as opposed to the new Proposition uh, 19 rules, which is under proposed Revenue Taxation Code Section 62. So under the 63.1 scenario, if it's a principal residence that is transferred, parent and child or child and parent, um, that is, uh, that they're eligible, uh, but it's limited now under Proposition 19 after 216. Then for other real uh, property, there was uh, an exclusion on the first $1 million of the full cash value. Full cash value is essentially the assessed value. So with that, there were a number of, uh, of properties that could be transferred. A vacation home, a rental, uh, anything of that sort could be transferred and as long as um, property owner does not use up their full $1 million exclusion on the assessed value of those properties, uh, they were able to utilize the parent-child exclusion. Again, that was repealed or uh, limited. Uh, um, well, that, that portion is, is repealed, but uh, it's, it's repealed as of 2-16-21, uh, notwithstanding any transfers that occurred by death or, uh, prior to that date would still be under this uh, scheme here. So as I had mentioned, the full cash value is essentially the assessed value. Then, uh, and we will revisit uh, the parent-child exclusion here in a minute, but uh, I just want to point out that under um, 64A, there are also transfers and in interest to legal entities. And this is important because there are some uh, recent uh, questions and answers from the Board of Equalization in regards to legal entities. But if you transfer uh, a legal entity interest, such as an LLC interest to a, um, uh, somebody else, uh, it's not a change in ownership with two exceptions. So, uh, well, actually, uh, there's the interspousal transfer exclusion that's available. And there are two, uh, or there are two with the parent-child exclusion. But the parent-child exclusion is not available uh, for the transfer of an entity interest. It only is applicable for the transfer of real property by deed. So if there is a transfer from parent to child or child to parent of a legal entity, 6.1 did not apply. The exceptions to the uh, Exclusion from transfers are under Section 64C that uh, 
notwithstanding if you make a transfer, it's not a change in ownership. If somebody becomes a more than 50% legal owner in that property, then it is um, a transfer of ownership. So let's say, for example, I set up a uh, an LLC, a single member LLC, and I own 100% of that. And uh, with my uh, with my six children, I transfer one sixth interest in that legal entity to each one. None of them ever acquire a more than 50% interest, so that is not deemed to be ownership. However, if amongst them they uh, were to acquire interest, and somebody acquired a more than 50% interest then the change in ownership would be true at that point. Notwithstanding, Section 64D has a, uh, another overlay to that. And uh, with 64C, as long as the property was acquired um, by, uh, by, the, uh, by the entity, um, 64D doesn't apply. But if 64D applies, then we have a, a different rule. And essentially, what 64D says is that if you take advantage of that proportional interest uh, transfer that we were talking about under Section 62, that's actually Section 62A2. Uh, once you do that, you have individuals that become original co-owners. And those are the ones who are holding those proportional interests there. And uh, to the extent that a transfer is made uh, by any of those original co-owners, if the cumulative transfer is more than 50%, then a change of ownership occurs there. So there are two tests, and they can sometimes become, can become confusing as to whether 64C applies or 64D applies. But that's a, a, an important distinction to make. So with that backdrop, I want to talk here about, uh, under Proposition 19, parent-child exclusion. So there are some uh, limitations. Remember, under the old law, under 63.1, um, the principal residence could be transferred between parent and child uh, at any value. And, uh, but now, there is a $1 million maximum benefit that we will detail. What that means is that um, um, before uh, Proposition 19, uh, we were able to transfer a home. For example, we had a client who had a home that uh, they were retired school teachers in San Jose, and they had a home that had a fair market value of $2.5 million, but the assessed value was only $150,000. And so uh, they were able to take advantage of the uh, uh, Section 61 pre-Proposition 19 uh, make a transfer for their children, which it was an unlimited value, whereas under Proposition 19, they wouldn't get that same benefit on their principal residence. Uh, there would only be a benefit of a million dollars that they could transfer, and anything above and beyond that, which we'll illustrate here in a little while, would uh, be uh, added to the tax base. Okay, so under this parent-child exclusion that's available, here are, uh, or excuse me, on the base year value transfer, this is what Kevin is going to discuss later, and that's going to be, uh, that's also part of Proposition 19. Now I'm going to go into Proposition, uh, or the parent-child exclusion that are available. Doug, I did just want to point out that, um, <clears throat> as in the previous slide, uh, the parent-child exclusion is limited by Prop 19, the base year value transfer is expanded. So whereas previously, at least in our office, most of our property tax planning had to do with parent-child exclusions, going forward, uh, we expect there to be some, some shift uh, towards base year value transfers because they're, they're much more available in terms of uh, clients are now able to move anywhere in California and transfer their base year value, and they can do it up to three times per person, six times per couple. I just wanted to point, point out that, that shift in, um, from the planning attorney's perspective, you probably see more base value transfers. Good point. Thank you.
Okay, so under the uh, current or under the Proposition 19 parent-child exclusion, uh, it is more restricted than before, uh, and it's limited to uh, transfers of a family home or family farm to a child, and that uh, child has to occupy that principal residence or use that family farm within one year. So let's just uh, take a quick look at the history here that we uh, have with Proposition 58, which is when we had the first parent-child exclusion that was available. There was an overwhelming approval by the electorate in regard, or by the um, by voters, of 75 percent. Then Proposition 193 brought in the grandparent and grandchild exclusion. Still, there was an overwhelming majority who were, you know. Now, moving forward to 2021 with Proposition 19, we see that the limitations barely squeak by with a 51% uh, approval. And uh, I will not get into the, uh, the politics in regards to this. There are many people that are um, upset with the way it was presented in the ballot, uh, not uh, revealing uh, some of the downsides, like the loss of the $1 million exclusion and uh, current child principal residence uh, transfer. But uh, you can see how narrow that was. So <clears throat> in regards to the parent-child exclusion, you again have the Constitution, and you can see uh, the reference to the uh, uh, amendment, which is Section 2.1, uh, which uh, uh, adds the, uh, the parent-child exclusion. We have Revenue and Taxation Code Section 2, which is proposed by the legislature, and that is sitting on the uh, governor's desk right now. And as far as we uh, we checked, uh, I think yesterday, or maybe even today, most recently, and it hasn't been signed. And then there's also the proposed property tax rules uh, that had been issued by the Board of Equalization. So again, for pre-February 16, you can see it says February 16 and 17, and we're going to talk about why there's a difference between Under 63.1, uh, that was uh, enacted uh, pursuant to Section 2H. We have the regulatory guidance from the Board of Equalization. These are the property tax rules that we have relied on in the past for 63.1, including opinion letters and letters to the assessor. For post February 16, 17, 2021, under Proposition 19, that was added by Section 2.1, uh, references there. Senate Bill 539 is the uh, Senate bill that is sitting on the governor's desk right now, which is a proposed addition of Section. And again, regulatory guidance is from the Board of Equalization. You can see that. Um, uh, again, the uh, Board of Equalization has a very uh, robust uh, website that gives uh, a substantial amount of, uh, of guidance. And so the purpose of this presentation is not to make it so that everyone becomes an expert in regards to uh, property taxes, but it's to just give you some guidelines and references that when you do have an issue come up with a client, uh, you have the opportunity to, make, uh, to refer to these slides and uh, look in deeper uh, to the um, various resources that are out there. So, like I indicated before, this is on the governor's desk. This was put on the governor's desk as of uh, the 13th of the. So, this slide is just to kind of show you a little bit of the difference between the former law, 61, and the current law, 63.2 see that um, principal residence under the former law, there was no value limit, whereas now there's a value limit on what you can transfer before you have a reassessment or an increase in the tax base for a family home and a farm. That's a, a million dollar um, exclusion that you essentially have before you start adding to the, the property tax base. Uh, with the, under the former law, you had to file the claim within three years or before you make a transfer to a third party of that property that was received. 
uh, under the new law, you have to file a homeowner's exemption within one year of the transfer. In addition to that, you can file the claim within three years before the transfer to the third party. Or under the old law, we had the uh, transfer of other real property of a million dollars of assessed value, and that is per person. So for a married couple, uh, they would have a combined two million dollars. Factor to base value is essentially the, uh, the assessed value uh, that is found in the property tax statement. Uh, there is, um, you can uh, send an email to the Board of Equalization and ask a request for the status of an individual's $1 million uh, assessed uh, uh, exclusion or the exclusion that they have available. So we send that in by fax and we get a report back from the uh, State Board of Equalization, they will indicate either that none of it has been used or they will show, uh, because they get a report that is sent to them from an office, uh, the property that was transferred and the amount of the assessed value uh, that was utilized under this $1 million exclusion. Okay, I'm not going to, I'm uh, providing this to you. This is just a summary of the constitutional change. But in the interest of time, we're not going to uh, go through this in, in great detail, other than to understand that um, family homes, uh, which is also defined as a principal residence, uh, are a part of the constitutional as well as family farms. So this is referred to as the intergenerational transfer. All right, so let's take a look at the dates uh, that uh, Proposition 19 had, uh, was effective. That's why we have a little bit of a fudge as to whether it's uh, effective February 17th or February 16th. So on uh, February 15th, it was, a, it was a holiday. And so under the government code, it required that any effective date is pushed forward to the next day. So the Board of Equalization uh, sent out a, uh, a memo in regards to that on January 8th of 2021. Uh, that was question and answer number one, where they did indicate that it was February 17th. So we were able to make inter vivos transfers actually on February 16th uh, and still be compliant under the old law. However, uh, if someone has, uh, if there is a death, uh, the transfer is deemed to occur on the date of death. The holidays have nothing to do with that. And so in that case, in the event of a testamentary transfer, uh, it has to be um, before February 16th. So any uh, death that occurred on February 15th or earlier would be subject to the old law, whereas on or after February 16th. Okay, so under the Constitution, we talked about change in ownership, and uh, it does not a change of ownership does not include following where fam, uh, the transferor who owns a family home makes a transfer, and that can be either from child to parent or parent to child, and the property has to continue or qualifies the family home to the transfer. That is the major difference between the old law and the new law, is that in the past you could make a transfer of the principal residence. There was no requirement that uh, whoever received it had to continue it as a uh, family home. As a rental, they could make it a, a vacation home, they could do with it whatever they wanted to. But now, uh, the limit here in regards to the, um, the transferee is they need to treat it as a Okay, so on this slide, um, again, in the interest of time, um, we'll just kind of briefly go through this. We have some examples. But essentially, if you are transferring a family, let's use the, the example of a family home. If you transfer that, 
have a um, taxable value or a base year value that is, uh, a, a, say, $200,000. And uh, when you transfer the home, let's say that the fair market value of the home is $1.2 million. Um, you take the um, base year uh, value of $200,000 plus the $1 million, and as long as that amount does not exceed um, uh, that $1 million plus the base year value, then you're able to transfer that base year value to the, uh, the child uh, in, this, in that example. However, if the value of the property is greater, then we will uh, um, have we will show you the calculations. But there will be an add-on because of the excess value over the uh, 1.2 dollars in that example. Here we go with our example. Let's say that we have taxable value of the home immediately prior to the transfer. And let's, uh, so Paul has his home in Hercules and he transfers it to his uh, Camden and Conrad. And in this case, we have um, a taxable value or base year value uh, or assessed value of $400,000. So the uh, assessed uh, fair market value of the home is $1.3 million. What is the uh, new taxable value of the uh, home when it's transferred to the child? So what we do is we take the prior taxable value plus of four hundred thousand plus one million dollars, and that equals one point. Okay, but the fair market value of the home is only one point three, so we're under that uh, assessed or that uh, base year value plus one million, because it's one point three million. So we're safe, and we're able to transfer. Uh, to that child, in this case Camden and Conrad, uh, the property without any kind of a, a reassessment. That's our, uh, uh, we continue with the $400,000 assessed value. Now let's take a look and see what happens in the case that the fair market value of the home that is being transferred to Camden and Conrad is $1.5 million. We go through the same calculation where we take the uh, prior taxable value of 400,000 plus 1 million, 1.4 million. Then we compare that to the actual fair market value of the property. See that $100,000 greater. So in that case, 1.5 million minus the 1.4, and we have $100,000 that is then added to the base year. For the assessed value, so the new assessed value has gone from 400,000 to 500,000. The old law that wouldn't have mattered. We would have been thousand regardless of the value. Now you're given a one million dollar exclusion uh, before you start adding to the um, uh, property tax base when it's transferred to uh, children. In this case. We also have um, similar provisions between grandparents and grandchildren, and that's also a part of, uh, of the Constitution. And uh, there are certain limitations in regards to that. Uh, essentially, in order for that to work, um, and allow for an exclusion between grandparents and grandchildren, uh, the parents need to have. Now, there are some exceptions to that, uh, which we'll take a look at, but. Um, that is not, uh, you know, a, a planning option at all. Where someone, uh, uh, so that's uh, a situation where it would work if uh, both parents are have essentially uh, children. So grandparents would be able to then use skip generation, so to speak. Family, uh, family farms. Okay, wherever family home is in the. Uh, Constitutional uh, amendment, family farm can be uh, uh, put in there. However, it's not limited to the one million dollar uh, adjustment. That is one situation where the family farm uh, does not have that uh, that limitation. So you can have, if the, we had the family farm as that example that we were looking at before, of one point five million dollars, 
the assessed value would still be $400,000 because we don't have to uh, calculate that uh, $1 million limit. Okay, this uh, is also available uh, for uh, uh, regards to the homeowner's exemption when it is by the transferee or a child in uh, what we uh, you have to qualify for either the homeowner's exemption or the veteran's exemption at the time of the purchase of the uh, transfer uh, of the the transferee needs to file that within one year of the date of purchase in order to uh, maintain that property tax benefit. So let's take a look at uh, qualifying transferees. So for the, uh, in, the, uh, in the statutes, it says that uh, the transfer going from a parent or parents to children is plural. And so we're going to talk a little bit about um, if all children have to uh, you know, qualify as uh, using it for a principal residence or not. But we need to have at least one eligible transferee within one year of the transfer to hold on to that as their, uh, as their principal residence. So in this case, if we have, so let's say that we have um, multiple children, at least one of the children has to reside in the home as a principal resident, or if it's a family farm, you need to utilize it as a family farm. If down the road they move out and it's no longer their principal resident, and that exclusion is removed. Essentially, the assessor can uh, can go back and, uh, or well, that the assessor can then uh, uh, call back uh, what the uh, amount would be uh, going forward in regards to the um, assessment. So you can't live in the home for a limited amount of time as a principal residence and then say, okay, I'm going to change how I'm using this, and I've already qualified for the exclusion. The exclusion is ongoing, and so you have to continuously apply and be eligible. So if a child moves out and says, I no longer want this as my principal residence, another child can move in, and they have to do that in one year, and then in that case, the exclusion will be removed. Okay, so for a qualifying transferees, transferees between grandparent and grandchild, here um, this is where we talk about some of the. Uh, uh, this is where the grandparents uh, are able to transfer it if parents, their their children, meaning the parents of the grandchildren, are deceased. As a so that could actually happen upon um, date of death of a grandparent if it's being. Or it can be an inter vivos transfer. There are exceptions, and one is for a son in law or a daughter in law of the grandparent who is a step parent or the grandchild, they need not be deceased. So there are a few little carve outs in regards to uh, those who need to be deceased. Uh, it also talks about adoptions and uh, when they uh, would be adopted. Uh, also, a stepchild uh, would be able to qualify uh, under certain circumstances. Uh, a son-in-law or a daughter-in-law would be able to qualify. Any child who's adopted, they have to be adopted uh, before reaching age 18. So sometimes somebody would ask, well, if I could adopt uh, my friend who's 55 years old, uh, can I take advantage of the parent-child exclusion? And the answer was no, because you had to be adopted uh, while a minor. Even foster children can qualify. And so that's something else to take a look at. So whenever you're uh, talking with a client and looking at their, uh, their family makeup, um, 
it's pretty expansive as to uh, who would qualify as a child. So uh, that's something to, uh, again, close look at uh, in regards to the qualifications that are available. Now for the transferees, this is something that uh, is interesting. That is, is that uh, the principal residence uh, or family farms, uh, there's an unlimited number that could be transferred. So theoretically, somebody could have a principal residence, transfer that to a child who would treat it as their principal residence, and then purchase another property, or maybe they have a rental and they turn that into a principal residence. And after they have lived in that for the requisite period of time, would be able to transfer that as a principal residence. So there's no limit as to how many principal residences transferred, and the same is for family farms. So the qualifying property that we have here, is there a difference between family home and principal residence? No. Uh, you'll find that family home is referred to in the Constitution, but in uh, Revenue and Taxation Code Section 62, place as a, our principal residence, uh, those are the same uh, according to the uh, Board of Equalization. Here's the interpretation that the Board of Equalization has given to residents. So uh, you'll be able to take a look at this slide. Uh, because of the interest of time, we need to continue on with this. Family farm, that is defined as the place of a real property where it is under cultivation, pasture or grazing, or agricultural commodity. So we may see an uptick in people wanting to uh, acquire family farms to pass on to their children. Uh, there is a question as to whether a principal residence needs to be on the family farm, and no. It can be uh, just a farm, and no home needs to be on it. Uh, can we uh, consist of multiple parcels uh, for a family home or a family uh, farm? If, if the parcels make up a single appraisal unit, then yes. So again, that's something that would have to be taken factors that are considered. Again, in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, go through this, um, bypass this, uh, that example right there. And uh, here are some particular examples that you'll be able to take a look at uh, that, um, you know, does ownership occur on the transfer of a life estate? And so um, that is something to, uh, to take a look at because somebody may transfer a piece of property subject to a life estate before it goes to a qualifying transferee, meaning a child. So the change of ownership refers uh, back to Faith's example. Unfortunately, we have to, uh, in the, in the, I have to go through this. Uh, pro rata distributions. Now, this is a strategy that has been used in the past in Proposition 19, not change it at all. So, in the past, if you had the ability to make a distribution, share and share alike in an estate, uh, you were able to take perhaps a piece of real property, and let's say it has a million dollar value to your children, and uh, you want to, uh, one child wants the property as their own principal residence, the other one wants to be cashed out. There is a strategy where the uh, personal representative can acquire a loan on the property and be able to use the cash from that refinance or from that financing transfer that to child A who wants the cash and child B resident subject to the income. That strategy is still available. Uh, the question is whether there's any impact on a legal entity interest. Um, there is uh, no change in regards to that. Inclusion for family farms and uh, uh, homes applies only to a transfer of the actual real property, not to an entity. This is, uh, this is a big one, and uh, unfortunately we don't have time to talk about it, but in the past had the ability to uh, use the step uh, transact or make a step transaction 
without the Board of Equalization or the, uh, the assessor coming in and saying, um, we're going to collapse this transaction and treat it as a one transfer, and we're going to disregard the steps that you took in order to preserve property tax exclusions. And so there was a specific legislative uh, note in that in regards to uh, encouraging and allowing uh, step transactions. In fact, uh, members of the Board of Equalization, I've been to uh, various presentations where they have advocated as to how to use the step transaction, uh, um, coupled with um, uh, using some exclusions under Section 2, 64D, as well as 63.1. And you can use all of those in various steps to be able to transfer property without uh, causing a reassessment. Now with Proposition 19, and that, uh, that ability is taken away, and that's uh, basically what is uh, the Board of Equalization has up in this letter to the assessors. Partial transfers, you can uh, make a transfer of less than 100% so that uh, a child could own maybe a 25% interest as long as they also are treating that as their family home, they would qualify. And here's an example that, unfortunately, we don't have time to take a look at. Here's an example of uh, following uh, a trust transfer following a life estate. And in the interest of time, these are things that uh, you'll have available uh, from uh, Ann Wolf, uh, this information here slides, so that you'll be able to take a closer look at And uh, here's an example of the, uh, the forms that would be uh, filed on. One last comment is that in regards to prospective relief, if you do not qualify or you do not submit the documentation on a basis, uh, you may not be able to recoup what you had paid in the past, but you still can qualify prospectively going forward where they would reduce the tax base you could lower your uh, property taxes, but uh, they would not allow you if you are beyond the three-year period, in most cases, or after you've transferred it, that was a three-year period the uh, taxes that you could. All right, I'm going to now turn the time over to Kevin, and he's going to talk about base year uh, value transfers. All right, thanks, Doug. Um, there we go, okay. So, generally a change in ownership occurs on a purchase of a residence, construction, but uh, under the, the new base year value transfer rule, um, which are, are largely similar to the old rules, except for the expansion to placement property being available all throughout California, as opposed to within a county or between participating counties. Um, and also that there's, there's no value limitation, so you don't need to have a, a lower value. Um, so, Qualifying homeowners may take uh, may transfer Prop 13 taxable value from the original residence to hmm. So as we mentioned, Prop 19 expands the existing base year value transfer options. It's for anywhere in California, no value limitation. And of course, uh, the transfer may be used up to three times per person, six times per married couple. Let's talk about briefly some, some history. So uh, there have been various permutations and adjustments to the base year value transfer provisions over the years. It started out in 1986, same year as Prop 58 in the parent child exclusion. There was Prop 60, um, this allowed um, those 55 years and older 
to make a base year value transfer within uh, the same county. And then um, see the, the list there for severely and permanently disabled transfers and governor proclaimed disaster. Uh, it's just interesting to note that um, in 2018 there was Proposition 5, um, which proposed to expand the base year value transfers. And the, the provisions were not as expansive as Prop 19, um, but even so, just looking at that specific question, the voters uh, turned that down. Of course, that was a, a midterm election, not a presidential election, so the electorate is a little bit different. Um, but it's just interesting to note that that was initially uh, defeated in 2018. Whereas Prop 19, of course, passed in a very close vote. Um, and it's hard to say whether uh, what effect there was because of the multiple questions proposed on the same ballot measure. Instead of just looking at a Base your value transfer measure, or just looking at the parent child exclusion, we had both on the same ballot initiative potentially that uh, could have led to more confusion in the. So, briefly, just some history on base your value transfers for governor proclaimed disasters. Um, they're actually. Previously, there were actually three revenue and taxation code provisions with, that uh, address this issue. There's 69.5, 69, and 69.3. Um, there's a letter to assessors that clarifies that 69 and 69.3 remain available to disaster victims after Prop 19. So essentially, disaster victims have a menu of options um, that include the uh, Red Taxation Code 69, 69.3, and now the new uh, law that we expect to be passed very soon, which will be Re Revenue Taxation Code 69.6. You can see the breakdown, some of the comparison between these options, but the, uh, the main point here is that um, disaster victims have several options to get relief, not just limited to the new provisions under Prop 19. So let's move on to overview the legal authority and guidance that we have, the new base your value transfer provisions. For the pre-April 1st, 2021 base your value transfers, like I said, we have various propositions. These all essentially amended Section 2 of the Article 13A of the Constitution. Um, mentioned the Revenue Taxation Code provisions. Of course, as we've mentioned before, there's various guidance on the Board of the Equalization website, various opinion letters and letters to assessors. Um, I particularly wanted to highlight the uh, letter to assessor on 2006-10, which gave an overview of all of the various base value transfer options and had various questions. That was very helpful to look at. So post April 1st, 2021, we're looking at section 2.1 B and E. Those are the new provisions added with Prop 19 um, related to base or value transfers, also 69.6, and then for the equalization material. Again, just wanted to highlight um, kind of the way to think about this is you have the, the broad constitution provisions that give the outline and intent of the new law, and then that's filled out by the legislature and uh, the Revenue Taxation Code, and then uh, you get the fine-grained detail with the Board of Equalization who give 
great interpretation and uh, application to specific facts. Um, again, uh, we're, we're waiting for that new 69.6, .6, which should send off by the governor very shortly, we expect. Um, and then just to get a broad overview of the, of the provisions here, um, again, they're, they're broadly similar to the old provisions um, in the way they work. Um, but they're all laid out here in the constitutional amendment. So after, on and after April 1st, 2021, we have the three categories, over 55 years of age, severely disabled, or a disaster victim, and for the taxable value of their primary residence to a replacement anywhere in the state, regardless of value, purchased or newly constructed as that person's principal residence, two years of the sale of the original primary residence. So we'll get we'll get into the detail on the within two years requirement um, more in a bit. And of course make three transfers per person. It does not matter if you've previously made base your value transfers. It's a fresh slate uh, for, for everyone. And also I should note that um, Three transfer limitation applies only to transfers for those over 55 years and, o and over and severely disabled. The limitation of three transfers does not apply to disaster victims. Effective date, like you said, uh, this is more straightforward. It's April 1st, 2021. And uh, the tricky or technical thing here is that it's determined as of the date of the transfer of the taxable value, which under the new law occurs on the later of the sale of the original property or the purchase or construction of the replacement dwelling. So it's the later of those two we're looking at in terms of the actual effective date. And um, that is interesting because it means that we, for planning purposes, we have a window looking back two years um, before the April 1st date, you previously purchased a dwelling and would like to make that a, a replacement principal residence, and uh, you know, get on, sell your home uh, within the two-year period, and you can make that base year value transfer work, even though it, it is can long before this April 1st deadline. For, uh, Effective. Here's a quick example. So November 2019, the complete construction of a replacement dwelling in El Dorado County. Of course, in 2019, they had no idea that Prop 19 was going to pass. Um, now, in October 2021, the claimant sells the original property in Walnut Creek, has a $500,000 taxable value. Assuming all other requirements are met, we'll get into that later, uh, the claimant will be eligible because the transfer occurs after April 1st, 2020. Well, benefits there. You can see that it's, it's between two entirely separate counties in California, so you have a whole state to work with in terms of finding the replacement dwelling. One practical consideration just to bring up here, and we'll talk about it more later, but the owner will pay taxes on the full cash value of the replacement dwelling. That purchase or construction occurs before the sale. Um, they'll have to pay taxes on the full cash value, the fair market value at the time of purchase or construction until the base year value transfer occurs. And then after the fact, they'll be eligible for uh, refund or cancellation of uh, taxes are owed. Uh, just a slight change in, in the example. Say that the sale occurred um, in March 2021, before April 1st, and then is recorded uh, in April kind of a technical issue, but uh, we have 
a property tax rule that indicates that for a sale of real property, um, it's considered to be effective on re recordation. Uh, and the reason for that is because that's assumed to be uh, very close to the date when the sale will close, uh, escrow profits will close. So who is eligible uh, to make a base year value transfer? We, we've mentioned the three categories. We have those who are at least 55 years of age. Um, if you read the California Constitution, it repeatedly says over 55 years of age. But that's in fact defined to mean at least 55 years of age. So just remember that. Try to avoid uh, getting confused because it can Severely disabled, note that it's severely disabled, not severely and permanently disabled, and a victim of wildfire, or a governor declared natural disaster. Um, you have to be the owner uh, on, on record title uh, of the original primary residence, maybe a co owner, and a spouse is only one spouse who will be the claimant value transfer must meet the eligibility requirements. Um, of course, it needs to be a primary resident. And uh, here we run into the issue of technical language again. So primary residence essentially means principal residence. Uh, the way it's defined, it refers to those who are eligible for the homeowner's exemption or the disabled veteran's exemption, but the eligible for those exemptions, you have to have a principal residence. Um, so it's kind of embedded in there. But for practical purposes, think about a principal residence as someone's true, fixed, and permanent home to which they intend to return. Uh, the assessors will look at voter registration, vehicle registration, bank accounts, et cetera. Um, so that allows for you know, temporary changes in domicile. Uh, as long as you intend to return, prove that to the assessor, then uh, that remains your principal residence. So under the new revenue taxation code section, that then we hope to be um, That defines original property. Um, again, it's a technical definition, but Embedded in there is principal residence, so just think about principal residence when you're eligible property. Um, so, as I mentioned, over means at least 55 years of age, and that requirement applies not at the date of the transfer of the base year value, but it applies at the date of sale. So, even if the sale occurs before the replacement value, or the, before the replacement property is purchased or constructed, um, you have to be 55 or over at the sale. Um, and if married, both spouses do not need to be 55 years of age again. Just one spouse will be the claimant of this law. Here's another example. Um, June 2020, Candace and Charles, note that they're both at this time under age 55, sell their original property uh, in San Ramon for $1 million. Charles turns 55 in April 2022, and then they purchase a replacement property in San Luis Obispo. Um, do they meet the, the timing requirements? For base year value transfer. No, they do not. Again, that's because uh, Charles was the claimant in 55 after the original property was sold. Um, another quick example, Candace and Charles again. Charles turns 55 in April 2022. 
I noticed that this time in June 2020, they purchased the replacement residence in Los Obispo. And in May 2022, um, they sell the original property. So in this example, Charles is 55 when the original property is sold. Therefore, uh, they qualify, assuming other requirements are met. So for those who are severely disabled, um, that is not defined in Prop 19, uh, which makes it a little bit difficult to pin down exactly what that means. Uh, so it's not defined in the constitutional language. Um, the Board of Equalization has clarified that it will not mean that the uh, claimant is permanently disabled and it does not require a physical disability. So that opens up the possibility of uh, mental, cognitive, or developmental conditions qualify. From a practical perspective, um, when you make the claim, uh, you need a certification from a licensed physician uh, certifying that the disability is in fact severe and identifying the specific reasons why the disability necessitates the move. That actually seems to uh, raise the bar a little bit in terms of qualifying being that doctor certification, and also the claimant must certify who is related to the disability. So uh, here are some of the new forms that have been produced for Prop 19. Uh, this is BOE 19 uh, D, and then there's also BOE 19 DC, which is a certificate of disability. Um, on that form, it clarifies that uh, it's a broader definition of severely disabled, does not require a permanent disability. You do have to justify move and get it signed off by a physician. Um, one confusing thing is that if you look at the new provision under 69.6 .6 of the Revenue Taxation Code, uh, it repeatedly does, in fact, say severely and permanently disabled, even though the Board of Equalization assured us that permanence was no longer a requirement. Um, so that definitely raises some confusion, and hopefully they'll give us some more guidance to, to clarify that. For disaster victims, uh, the original property has to be subject to substantial damage. That's defined as uh, damage that is more than 50% of the value immediately before the disaster. Um, we'll get into more of the detail on that, I think, on the slide. And uh, it's important to note that the, it must have been the principal residence of the claimant on the date the property was damaged. And the property must be sold in the damaged That is a little bit frozen, so. There we go. Okay. So, uh, substantial damage must be physical damage in general, but they did specify that restricted access caused by the disaster can qualify. Um, So the natural disaster can be a wildfire, as defined in the code, the government code, or a disaster as declared by the governor. Um, and those disasters are listed online. Um, okay, so as we mentioned, no more than three transfers for claimant even if they've already made base or value transfers in the past under the prior law. 
uh, does not apply to disaster victims. Disasters can make a total of six transfers. What is qualifying original property? It must be located in California. And then we get to the, the two-year provision. So within two years of the purchase or construction of the replacement resident, the original resident must be occupied as a principal resident of the claimant and within two years it must be sold. And a sale uh, requires a 100% appraisal event. Um, so no gifting or any other transaction that is less than a full reappraisal. Um, property may be part of a multi-unit uh, dwelling. We're not going to get into the details on, on that, but um, there are uh, guidelines in the letters to assessors, which you can find on the BOE uh, website, um, the uh, Prop 19 guidance. Um, so So in this example, the sister sells only 50%, purchases a new residence. Um, it does not qualify because there was not a 100% change in ownership on the sale of the original property. So there must be a full reappraisal on both sides, on the sale and the, the purchase side of the transaction. What qualifies as a replacement dwelling must be principal residence. Then the two-year requirement, uh, it can be located anywhere in California. There's no value limitation. Here's a quick example with some uh, numbers to kind of clarify that. The Chandler sells his residence for $515,000. Uh, he and two other persons purchase a, a replacement dwelling and um, so it does qualify for base year value transfer because there is a full reappraisal on both sides. Um, the sale of the original residence and on the purchase, even though he purchased it with other co-owners, um, Board of Equalization has specified that, that that's okay. Um, I just want to move on to maybe some more fundamental concepts here. Um, Again, the two-year requirement applies to two different items. It's two years between the sale and the replacement, and also two years between occupancy as a principal resident and the purchase or construction of the replacement dwelling. Um, I do just want to quickly go through um, some of these timelines here. It helps to illustrate. So in this timeline, we have the purchase before the sale. Um, so sale must occur within two years of the purchase. The claim must be made within three years of the purchase. Um, we'll get to those slides later, but I just wanted to point that out. It's the claim is made based on three years from the purchase or construction of the replacement dwelling, even if that occurs before the sale. So it's not within three years of the transfer, it's within three years of the replacement, and it's filed with the replacement county. Um, the second part of the transaction must occur after April 1st. So in this example, we have um, the occupancy occurring before the purchase, which occurs before the sale. So again, two years between purchase and sale, three years between purchase and claim. And in this example, uh, occupancy occurs within two years of the purchase pursuant to Revenue Taxation Code 69.6B1. Uh, but that raises the question is, did they really intend to allow a situation where occupancy ends up to four years um, before the sale occurs, as long as it's, it's within two years 
of the purchase or replacement, uh, purchase of the replacement loan. That's one question to look for for the guidance on. Um, it's a surprising result, but it's clearly, that's clearly what the statute says. Um, so here's a different timeline. Now we have the sale occurring before the purchase of the replacement dwelling. Again, you have to be within the, the two years of occupancy and purchase, three years of purchase and claim after April 1st, 2021 for the second part of the transaction. In this case, the purchase must be after April, April 1st, 2021. And, uh, one thing I want to illustrate is that if you make the sale before the purchase occurs, uh, the sale price isn't frozen, or the, the taxable value at the time of the sale is not frozen in time and for purposes of making the comparison to the uh, replacement dwelling. Um, does get adjusted for the intervening time period, as you can see. One point to point out very quickly is that for a disaster situation, we're still looking at two years between the sale and the purchase. Uh, the disaster itself may occur more than two years for uh, purchase of the replacement dwelling. So in that case, you might have you know, three end dates uh, adjusting the taxable value until the, the purchase date. So for calculating the new base year value, um, it's a two-step process. If the purchase price is equal or lesser than the sale price, then the taxable value equals the taxable, the taxable value of the replacement equals the taxable value of the original property. Again, adjusted for the inflation factors applying in the intervening time period. Um, are running out of time here. Hey, Kevin, yeah, Kevin, I just wanted to alert you that it's 128 and we had some questions. Um, I just emailed them to you and Doug, um, but if you want to wrap up, um, that would be great. Sure. So um, I invite all of you to go through these slides. I try to be very detailed and give a lot of examples um, to determine how you, you calculate um, the, uh, the comparison and how you calculate the, the new base year value for the replacement property. Um, it's all indicated here on the slides. Um, again, filing the claim within three years of the purchase of the replacement residence. Finally, I just wanted to, to wrap up by uh, looking forward. Um, this is not uh, critical, but just kind of interesting to think about. Um, So I just have some information here about Prop 19. Is it possible that it could be reversed? There's a Senate bill, but that has to clear a very high bar. Again, legisl legislation uh, to amend the Constitution has to be approved by a supermajority in both chambers. Um, we could have future ballot initiatives, but the people who made the largest monetary contributions were the ones who won in the Prop 19 case. So the question is, who's going to put up the money to reverse it? Uh, could there possibly be broader tax reform? Uh, we've heard about that, but that has not even been, been attempted since 2009. Uh, so the prospects of that look um, unlikely. Uh, but important to keep in mind that uh, with our analogy of the uh, ballot initiative kind of as, you know, tectonic process, creating new new tax law, new property tax law, um, the pressure is building over time the longer we go uh, from Prop 13 because the, the differentials between 
fair market values and people's taxable values of the property keeps incre increasing. So that, in some sense, is going to increase the political pressure to equalize the system. So you'd think there, there's going to be some efforts to do so in the future. What that looks like, possible to, to predict, but keep your eyes peeled for future changes in property tax law. So thank you very much, gentlemen. I, I think what we'll do here is I'm going to stop the recording. Um, so thank you very much.